husbands before I knew my husband. So I guess we really go way back. <laughs> Okay, here it is. He is our emergency manager office and disaster preparedness and project coordinator at Little Company of Mary Hospital. And he's going to speak today on disaster preparedness for home and work. And this is something we all need to be prepared for. So take notes if you need to, but this is something really dear to my heart. I just worry about you guys when we have power failures. And We've had two really big earthquakes lately, not here, but on the Ring of Fire, and we're part of the Ring of Fire. So, uh, welcome, Chris Ricardi. Thank you all for having me here today. Uh, although the presentation is home and work, uh, depending on where you go, what you do, any of your travels, maybe uh, work may be your. Uh, neighbor's house, maybe it may be your kid's house, I don't know, whatever that may tie into in, into your worldview. Uh, understand that what you and how you prepare is going to set you up for how well you thrive after an event. Uh, as is uh, customary with the Providence facilities is that we begin all meetings with a reflection. And this reflection is from Benjamin Franklin and others. Uh, by failing to prepare, surely you are preparing to fail. Now, basically, you know, we have a term. I'm, I am the disaster coordinator for a hospital. I prepare hospitals to be able to withstand or to endure a major disaster, whether that be a natural disaster or something that may be human-induced, maybe an act of terrorism or something along those lines. But as a hospital, we need to be prepared to be able to function and serve our community even after a disaster. Do you know that as a hospital, if an event happened, for my patients and staff, we have approximately eight to nine days worth of food that we would be able to thrive for that long a time without receiving any assistance from our community. But that takes planning. That takes uh, identifying what our risks are. We live in California. What's our biggest risk? Absolutely. So that means that we have the potential to lose power. And I'm looking around the room, and I see you have concentrators. I see you have various other things that I'm assuming would be necessary to sustain life or to sustain your well-being. Now, what do you have as a backup? to be able to utilize that if the power goes out for 12 hours? Generator. generator. Do you have a generator? No. I appreciate that, yeah. but if you don't, I see hands going up. Is that a generator in your house? You betcha. Perfect. I appreciate that. How many of you guys realize that although it may not be able to work for your concentrator, but it may work for charging your cell phone, etc., etc., if you have a car, you basically have a generator to be able to charge certain devices. Now, maybe you need an adapter, and this is something that you could put into your plan. But there are other things that take place. There are other uh, issues that you should be aware of. Now, in going through this, what I'm going to cover is to create an emergency plan for your preparedness, your planning procedures, a uh, little bit extra education that you can do, and uh, other resources that you can tap into that would be able to help you. Okay. So in going through this, I want you to leave this room today with more knowledge than you walked in. That's my goal. And hopefully that you'll put some of these things into practice. Now, I don't know how far away from here you live, but if you travel anywhere, if you drive over something or under something, you're going to get stuck on a freeway. All right? You may not even be home, nor maybe at work, or maybe at a family member's house. But you may get stuck on the road. How would you thrive if that is indeed the case? Because you know freeway systems are designed to fail. You go on an overpass, you see what happens uh, after major earthquakes. Pieces of that freeway drop out. Why? To keep the rest of the freeway from falling apart. So there are uh, pieces in there that will keep them uh, from failing completely. But to know that, what kind of tools do you have in place to thrive if you got stuck on a freeway? Do you have emergency supplies in your car? Yes. Beautiful. Do you have food, water, something that you can walk in, a blanket? 
A blanket will maybe be the best thing you can put into place as a life-saving uh, device in your car. Because if you're stuck in your car overnight, folks, we live basically in a desert. What happens at night? It's maybe 70 degrees during the day. How cold does it get at night? Right? You can drop it, sometimes lower than that. We've had, last winter, we were down into the upper 30s. It was frost on my next door neighbor's roof. So what do you do to keep yourself protected? Local disasters. Now, it's, it can and will happen here. There's no question about this. This, uh, just about a month and a half ago, we had some high wind storms, correct? How many of you guys lost power? I was one of them, right? So did you have uh, any fear of that power not coming on anytime soon? Did you have any need to worry? Now, what happens if that's going to last for two days or three days? What would you do then? How would you survive? How would you thrive? How many of you guys take medications? How many of you guys have extra, at least a week's worth of extra medication on you? Or at least in your disaster supplies? And I'm not talking beyond what your prescription tells you. I get asked how do you get extra medication, we'll cover that one in a minute. We can get a little bit more uh, creative in a little bit. So, uh, you guys familiar with mobile? You familiar with what's taking place here over these last, uh, well, especially the last few months? But a, a, about a year ago, February, actually it was a year ago, February, the mobile refinery blew up. They were a nice piece of equipment, blew up, uh, and shot a piece of, equipment approximately 200 feet in the air. I don't know if you realize how lucky we are that this piece of equipment, when it landed, only landed within a foot of a hydrofluoric acid tank. Now, if it would have hit that tank, anybody downwind from old would have had some severe distress. And I mean severe. And I'm talking 100 to 250,000 victims. Now, from a hospital perspective, to prepare for something like this is an incredible feat. This was a disaster at the hospital. We had to shut down air handlers because we had to shelter in place. How many of you guys got the alert that you needed to shelter in place and shut your windows, doors? How many of you guys even know how to do that? We all live within the, uh, the radius of ExxonMobil. You know there's some pretty toxic stuff, and not just at mobile, but at other places, at other manufacturing places throughout Torrance. This stuff gets airborne. We may need to. Did you guys hear the sirens two weeks ago? They did test work for sheltering in place. How many of you guys even knew what that was? This is good. I'm, I'm, there's five people that raised their hand. Do you know? You know, I hate to use this term, but when you're not aware and not in a place of preparedness, there's a term that they use. It's called natural selection. I, I'm sorry, that may be a bad joke. But understand, you're making decisions now as to whether or not to thrive after a disaster. So what other disasters would cause us grief? Now this would be man-made, basically. An earthquake, natural. Uh, high winds, natural. What other risks do we have sitting right here in Taurus? Fire, well, what, what kind of fire? House fire, maybe. So, how many of you know how to shut off your own gas? Right? Most. How many of you guys know how to shut off the gas at your next door neighbor's house? Because if, guess what happens at your next door neighbor's house if they have a gas leak and we're dealing with a fire or a major event? What's going to happen to your house? If it blows up, where's yours going? Probably up with it, right? So, you need to know how to take care of your neighborhood and your community as well. So other risks that we have is there's a freeway system that runs pretty much right through the middle of Torrance, right? Or at least a railway system that runs through Torrance. Do you guys have any idea how many things are in those rail cars that roll through <coughs> Torrance? I'll keep that, I'll let you guys do the research, but I'm telling you, it's pretty... I just started sleeping with both eyes closed again after learning some of these things, okay? So again, buildings crumble. This is the, uh, the Northridge earthquake. Now, you know how many injuries took place here? Now, you heard about the deaths. There's a handful, right? We had 33 that it says uh, got, uh, got killed. Now, mind you, death 
gets headlines. Do you know how many injuries took place during this earthquake? Do you know how many people needed to be treated in hospitals after this? 8,400 people. You don't hear about them though, right? So 8,400, within that our community, 8,400 people. You heard about the 33 that passed away. And God rest their soul, but the dead, and from a hospital perspective, it's already taken care of. And now we need to be able to manage those 8,400 people. Now, what if you're one of those 8,400? Do you know how long the fire department says it's going to take them, if we have a major disaster, for them to get to our neighborhoods, for them to get to our residential uh, spaces? Take a guess. <laughs> Try again. Uh, they, they say seven to ten days. My point. So, what do you have in place that's going to last, help you to sustain yourself for seven to ten days? Do you have enough food? Do you have enough water? How many of you guys have pets? How many of you guys have an extra disaster supply just for your pets? Because I tell you true, if that is part of the deal. How many, if you have dogs, you guys know what the dog looks like at you at 5.30 in the morning when it gets fed every day. Imagine not feeding your dog for two days and what it's going to look like at you at 5.30 in the morning. You may be its disaster plan. So they want you to make sure that you get just keep eating, okay? Folks, when you set up a disaster plan, and really, I'm not here to be chicken little and tell you that the sky is falling, okay? That, I'm not here to be a fear monger, but just to let you know that there are things you can do to put into place that will help you thrive. My 96-year-old grandmother was in Brooklyn during Superstorm Sandy, okay? They got stuck on the seventh floor of an apartment building in Brooklyn. The whole bottom floor was flooded. Couldn't use elevators, the heating in the building was out, okay? And it was pretty chilly. This was at the end of October. When, when I was speaking with her, I said, you know, you guys in good place, everything's all right, you're prepared. She was with her 86-year-old sister. Right? So I, I felt much more comfortable then, right? <laughs> so, but what did they do? How long, they had four days notice that this storm was cruising up the coast. So what do you do? How do you prepare? They went out shopping, picked up some bread, milk, and eggs. I can tell you, growing up in New York, anytime a snowstorm was coming, my parents would send me out to go buy bread, milk, and eggs. You have a couple of storms in a week, we had a whole lot of bread, milk, and eggs. But there were always basics. The, fun, the, the basics were in the house. So that's basically what they did. They went out and went shopping. They had enough food to last them for a couple of weeks. And knowing my grandmother, there would have been some natural selection taking place there if she needed to make the food last a little while longer. Kidding. You guys aren't really that much fun, huh? No, sorry, maybe these are just really crappy jokes. But we'll, uh, we'll just work our way on through this. You know, I, I, uh, I speak around the country at, for different hospitals and teaching hospitals how to prepare themselves, putting plans together. And uh, I was up in Sacramento for a uh, hot, this California Hospital Association meeting, and I told a pretty crappy joke where nobody laughed. It was a room of a thousand people, so I was able to pull that one off. If I tell crappy jokes here and just die right up here, I'm okay with that. <laughs> so, uh, with... Your, your emergency plan, what does this look like? So, how many of you guys have actually done a fire drill in your house? How many of you guys know how to get out of your house in an, if there's a fire at your front door? How would you know that fire is at your front door? Well, okay, here's another one. You got a smoke alarm? All you guys have smoke detectors. How many of you guys change the batteries on those things before it starts beeping at you? Three, four, yeah. perfect, I five. To, I okay, then right. <laughs> See what happens when the fire happens. So you hear the fire detector go off, the smoke detector. You just jump out of bed like my wife would, fan it with the dish towel until it stops beeping, and then go back to bed, right? Well, here's the deal. If you sat up in bed, that may be the last thing you ever do. Why? Because what kills you in a fire? Fire? Smoke. So if you can hear your smoke detector, you're under the layer of smoke, right? Because you're still alive to hear it. If you sat yourself up in bed, that may be the last thing you ever do. Because you start to inhale toxic gas, now you got real problems. Now, the, the ideal thing is to roll out of bed 
get down to the floor and crawl through the house. At least stay low, okay? I'm not going to tell you to roll out because that landing may be a little harder for some than others. But make sure you stay low and navigate yourself through the house on your hands and knees. How many of you guys have power failure lights in your house? These are, these are lights that plug into an outlet, and when the power goes out, the lights go on. Okay? But only when the power goes out. It won't light any other time. These are incredible devices. Where do you get those? Uh, you can find these at Home Depot, Lowe's, any of your hardware stores. You can get a couple of them for 10 bucks. These are probably one of the best things you'll have in your house when the power goes out. Why? Because your whole house, poof, lights up. Power goes out, the house lights up. What are they called again? Power failure lights. Now, my wife was in utter amazement. Uh, a couple of weeks back when the power went out because of the wind a couple of months ago. We were in the middle of watching TV. We were doing, it was a Sunday night. Bam, the power went out with the wind. Well, my whole house lit up. I had these power failure lights in strategic locations. My house was better illuminated without power than it was with. And she's like, how did you do that? <laughs> it's like you married a, a disaster person. Just be grateful for that. Yes, sir. What are the strategic locations? Uh, I had them in hallways so that I can navigate through the house, one in the bedroom, bathroom, hallway, living room, so that I could light a path of egress from my home. Mm -hmm. Now, and one of those lights, when it's pitch black and there is no light anywhere, does a pretty good job of lighting up a whole hallway. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I have this light alert and it goes off when the public is. Ooh. What? Um, start asking if I'm all right. Maybe it, it will alert them when the power goes out. Yeah. That's that's not a bad problem. I would rather have them calling me to make sure I'm okay than. That's a good thing. So these are nice little backup plans. Having some way of lighting, or how about a flashlight in your nightstand? You guys got flashlights in your nightstand? How many of those work on batteries? Now, this is the same group that doesn't change batteries and has smoke detectors, right? I just want to make sure I got the right folks, because then you're not changing the batteries in your, not your flashlight either. Yes, sir? Have you heard of, uh, not just replacing the batteries, but replacing smoke detectors every seven years or so? Uh, it depends on which one you have. I, I understand that the, the concept behind that, but some of them may work a little bit better, and I think with technology where it's at now, we're in a pretty good place. I wouldn't recommend changing them out every seven years, although now some of these smoke detectors are actually hardwired into your home, yeah. so you, you don't have to uh, worry about the battery issues. And don't put your batteries in a flashlight backwards and expect to turn them around when the <laughs> stuff hits the fan, because it, they discharge backwards too, okay? Yeah? Uh, you, can, you can also buy mm -hmm. flashlights that plug in. And yes. They're always dark. And that's a good point. Those power failure lights, are also can be unplugged and work as a flashlight for you in the process. And it's lit up so you even know where to find it. Imagine that. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Lucy Jones, the earthquake specialist, said the biggest uh, threat uh, from a major, major, major earthquake is long-term loss of power for residences. Do you agree with that? Uh, it is definitely one of the biggest issues we're going to face. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, one of the gifts I have about working within healthcare is I get to work with Dr. Jones, or I have before her retirement recently, and uh, with Caltech and Margaret Vinci, who's one of her trusty sidekicks. We, uh, you know, power failure, a long term, because how they're going to get this back up when this stuff is down, roads are going to be inaccessible. Uh, that this is a very major issue. How long would you be able to endure? One of the other things you need to worry about is the lack of water. Because the same place that the power comes in through the Cajon Pass, right, so does our water. So does our petroleum products. Uh, do you know why the Cajon Pass is the Cajon Pass? Just throw out a little geology for you. And it is where the San Andreas Fault goes through the mountains. <laughs> that's exactly where it goes. That's why it's a pass. It was a, it already had crumbled at that point. So now imagine a 17 foot displacement at that point, right? With the plate shifting. We're going to have other issues. Power, absolutely. Uh, water issues. Like when we have an earthquake, what's the first thing you need to do? A major earthquake. What's the first thing you should do in your home? 
smell for gas. That, that smell for gas, don't shut it off if you don't have to. Yeah. But shut off your water immediately. Water? Water. Now, why would you do that? <laughs> when it, correct. You don't want contaminants flowing into your home. Because right now, depending on if you went into, unless you went with tankless water heaters, you have right now in your water heater 25 to 50 gallons worth of water. The other place you can find water is your toilet tank. Now, for those of you that have pets, the bowl is probably already there, a water bowl anyway. But you, uh, the toilet tank will uh, does have clean, potable water. Now, if you have a pool, you can bathe in the pool. You can do other stuff. But 50 gallons of water is enough water for one person for 50 days, a gallon a day. Or two people for, well, you do the math, 25, right? Although I started you guys uh, trying to figure out, I heard somebody, you got 84 bucks, somebody was getting 44, the other one was getting 40, right? I'm kidding. But it, uh, and congratulations on that too. So understand, you need to put tools in place. So educate as to how to respond to these events. If you have a plan in place, it'll help you to respond. I grew up in New York, in case you couldn't tell that already. And when I learned how to drive, and you make a left-hand turn in front of traffic, we had this adage that he who hesitates, dies. Right now, if we had an earthquake, major, we're shaking, where are we going? Uh, and with the number of people in here, you talk about natural selection taking place, whoever's going to get under that first, but that's where you want to go. What is the adage? What do you want to do? Drop, cover, and hold on. What do you hold on to? Table. The table, because that table's going to be shaken, and you don't want the table to shake away from you while you're sitting there hiding underneath it, right? Because the, the roof, things will crumble, and you need to protect yourself. We don't stand in doorways. We don't uh, go next to the, the wall to try to get into the triangle of survival under a table, under, under firm objects, okay? So as we go through, understand your escape routes. Now, why understanding your escape route now? Because if you need a rope ladder to get out, off, out of the second floor of your building, how would you know that if you don't test it? Right? You've got to wait for the fire to try to get out of your house and say, damn, I wish I would have got one of those rope ladders. Maybe not be the right time. So identify your risks. Learn how to turn off your water, your gas. Shut off your gas if there's fire or you smell gas. Okay? Because gas may be the thing that keeps you with hot water. May be able to keep you with the sorted other goodies. Maybe even be able to cook. Okay. Uh, do you have well out of state contacts? You guys, well, do you guys all still have landlines, phones that plug into the wall, right? Those landlines work really well when in not time of need, but they will be uh, overburdened if this was a true event. 911 calls. You get reverse 911 calls on those lines. These are very, very helpful. But the only way you're going to make phone calls, you're not going to be able to do this locally on those lines other than calling out of state. Your long distance channels are open, but not local. Because 911 folks will, they will commandeer phone lines to be able to utilize and the overburden of the amount of people that are going to try to use it. So how many of you guys have a cell phone? Everybody, right? So your cell phone may not work because cell towers go down. But the email process may. So may the text. So, you know, I'd hear my grandmother tell, yell at me, like, don't be sending me one of those text things. Just call me. And don't send me pictures on a on text. Just call me. And I appreciate that. But learning how to text may be the way you communicate after a disaster. So it may be a good tool to put into your tool belt. So instead of, you know, yelling at, well, having some fun with your grandkids and tell them not to text you, Texting may be a good survival technique. So, and keep copies of your family information. And keep it in a safe, a waterproof, a fireproof safe, but your insurance documents, your um, a copy of your driver's license. If you can't get this stuff, you're not getting any insurance. Do you know that it took almost 10 years for folks in, in after Katrina to line up with their insurances? Because they didn't have documentation. Now, we know that insurance companies are in this for the money, and they're not just going to give you a check for however many dollars without any kind of verification. So remember these things. 
Um, and if this is your plan, this was the, the other half of the New Yorkers that got stuck with Superstorm Sandy. They wanted to know where FEMA was. Why? Because they didn't do anything to prepare. They had days knowing that this storm was coming. Did anybody get gas? <laughs> nah, I'll get it afterwards, right? It'll work just fine. Did anybody get cash? No, I got a card. Got my, my ATM. I have access to whatever I need. When the power failure happens, what don't you have? You have gas and you don't have cash or anything like that. What kind of backup do you have? What do you have in place? Cash is it. All of those folks that had a credit card, you know how much gas they got? <laughs> That's about right. They got about as much gas as they had cash. So if you're waiting for FEMA to show up, Folks, I tell you true, that's not the way this works. FEMA doesn't come into the rescue. They are not a responding agency. So develop a kit, make sure you have at least seven days. One gallon of water per person. One, a half gallon for hygiene, and the other half for consumption. If you have a pool, you can take care of the hygiene part, and then you've just doubled up your consumption water. Non-perishable foods. Folks, if you have a power failure that's expected to last any great length of time, and by that I mean 24 hours or greater, what's the first thing you need to eat? The items in your refrigerator. Okay? Eat what you can, because that's going to start to spoil pretty quick. Your milk is going to turn into cottage cheese pretty quick, right? That's that for a visual. Nice. Sorry about that right after lunch. That wasn't great. So, eat what you can, and if you have a means of cooking, a means of barbecuing up some of that stuff. You could cook some of that food and it'll last you a little while longer. But for the most part, anything in there over, usually about six hours in the fridge after power goes out, is going to need to be 86 anyway. So what would you eat after that? Not yet. We're getting close though. I'm going to use the, the uh, what would you eat after the refrigerated items? Freezer goods. Because now those are starting to frost. Now you can start tapping into those and, again, if you have the capability to cook, cook it. So before you even get to your canned goods, your dry goods, you've already gotten a day to a day and a half to maybe two of what you have that would be uh, perishable, right? Now you get to your canned goods, you probably have days for it. You figure a can of green beans will last you a pretty good time, right? As long as you have a can opener, because that's the other portion of the program. If you have a disaster supply, and if you have an electric can opener, guess how much you're going to eat out of those cans. You may have pretty sharp teeth by the time you get to it, but there's, make sure you have an extra manual can opener. All right? I told you about the flashlights. One of the things that I like to tell folks to use, if you don't have power failure lights, is to get some glow sticks. You guys have seen these plastic sticks that light up? Get one of those, put it in your nightstand. You don't ever have to worry about the batteries dying, and all you need to do is break it and shake it, and you have light. Now, one of the benefits of that is, again, that even if they expire and they're beyond their uh, uh, yes. lifespan, they, if they're a 12 hour, they're supposed to be illuminated for 12 hours, the only thing that expires is how long they stay lit. So you may be able to at least get out of your house with an expired glow stick. Yes? And, and that's a great point. Did you guys all hear that? To use your solar powered lights outside, to bring them inside to illuminate your house during any extended power failure. Novel idea. That's great. Thank you. So, what about home evaluation? Now, you know, I told you this is for work. I've been working with our home health and hospice teams that go out to homes to assist folks out in the community. Any of you guys uh, uh, get visits from home health or uh, anybody like that to help you out with any of your meds, any of your oxygen or anything like that? No? So, 
If you do, and these folks come to your house, they need to know your backup plan too. Because if they do come into your house, they may be stuck at your house for some great length of time. They know how. To, they need to know how to access some of the stuff, where to find your backup oxygen, where to find your medication. These folks may be there to help you. So make sure that they know how to do these things. Let, make sure you guys even know the risks in your neighborhood. Okay, shut off valves, they need to know these things and how to get out of your house if they have to. Uh, what other supplies do you need? First aid kit, whistle. What would you need a whistle for? Oh, yeah. That's Yell for help, right? You may need some assistance. You have a, a lifeline to the outside world. Everybody else, you may need to be doing a little whistle. Okay? Uh, particle mask, you get, there's going to be dust, debris. Your, uh, the houses will start to deal with other assorted goodies. Any breakage in the, in the walls, there's stuff in there. Uh, alcohol gel or some type of hand sanitizer. Because if you can't get to water, you still need to wash your hands. One of the biggest risks you're going to run into after a major event like this is infection due to walking on glass or doing something, cutting yourself and not being able to clean that wound. Uh, tools and a wrench to turn things off. Fire extinguishers. You guys all have a fire extinguisher. Right? My next door neighbor, about uh, four months ago, I hear these, these voice from on the other side of the wall. Chris. Chris. I'm like, what the heck is going on, right? I thought it was just, you know, just a good day. So I, I was like, I asked, and they're like, we have a fire, can you come over? I was like, whoa, whoa. So I get over to the house, and needless to say, somebody had put a wicker basket into the oven to, to, to keep it off of the shelf while it was drying. Well, this person number two didn't realize that there was a wicker basket in the oven where it doesn't belong anyway, and turned on the oven. Well, guess what they had? Fire in the oven. Uh, it, at least, at least, and I mean, I brought my fire extinguisher, but at least they had one. But here's the thing, none of them knew how to use it. Do you guys know how to use a fire extinguisher? Yeah. I'm going to give you guys a little uh, adage to keep in your head. It's called pass. Well, let, let's start with when you detect a fire. When you see a fire, you're going to use the acronym RACE. Rescue, anybody you can. Alarm, send the alarm, 911, right? Contain it, if it's behind a closed door, keep that door closed. Or evacuate or extinguish. Now, how do you know which one to do, whether it was evacuate or extinguish? Well, it depends on who it is, I would think, right? But here's something to keep in your head to help you to act quickly. Treat a fire like a bully. If a bully. If you're bigger than it, knock it down. If it's bigger than you, run away. Okay? So this way here, you don't have to sit there and go, hmm, is this a big fire or a little fire? Because you all said if it's a big fire. Well, what is a big fire to you may not be a big fire to you. It may not be or could be extremely huge to you. But we don't know. So again, just have a plan in your head. And to use a fire extinguisher, you're going to use the acronym PASS. This is what we teach our hospital personnel as well. PASS is to pull the pin, because there's a, a locking pin on a fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. yeah. Aim the nozzle, sw uh, squeeze the handle, and sweep right. from side to side. Yeah. Now I'm going to tell you, give you a fair warning, that if you have one, an ABC fire extinguisher that's got a, a hose and nozzle, you better hang on to the end of that hose. <laughs> Because when you squeeze that handle, that hose is going to be all over the place. And I don't know if you've ever been in a room with a discharged fire extinguisher. Breathing becomes a serious issue. And I tell you those that are respiratorily compromised, keep this in mind. Okay? That may make a big difference in your decision-making process as to whether or not you extinguish that fire. Okay? So, sleeping bags, tents, uh, matches, how would you light stuff up? And any type of first aid manual. For those of you that are trained in first aid, fantastic. Utilize those skills. Some of us, uh, you know, I can tell you just from my own perspective, some of the stuff you may know, you start to forget. You want to make sure you have some reference that you'd be able to utilize. For those of you with phones, there are actually first aid apps 
there are different things you can use on your own phone that will guide you through. And if you have an iPhone, Siri will help you. <laughs> Pick up kid. So again, extra supplies. Can opener, not electric. Pet food. And make sure you have extra water for them as well. Baby food, baby formula. You know, whether or not you have children or not, some of that stuff lasts a pretty long time and it's easily to be consumed and readily accessible. Medication. Now, with medication, how do you get beyond seven days beyond your month's worth of meds? If you need an extra week, you want to put some in your first aid or in your disaster supply kit. How do you think you can get some? I'm going to tell you, ask your doctor for samples. Okay? Chances are they're all on the hook with one of the pharmaceutical companies. Chances are they have extra goodies in their office. Okay? And if not, if you let them know what you need it for, that may be able to help navigate your insurance issues or ensure that you get that extra medication. Is that fair? Yeah. So at least tools. Cash, traveler's checks. Remember traveler's checks? Yeah. I know they still make them, but it, they seem to be so foreign these days. But make sure you have cash. And I don't mean in 20s, because if all you have are 20s, everything's going to cost you 20 bucks. Okay? Uh, change of clothing. Make sure you have this stuff in your disaster supplies, in your car. A uh, pair of underwear, a pair of socks. Now, you may have to wear the same pair of pants and you could probably pull that off for a week. Maybe a shirt. You may not have many friends, but you could probably still wear it for a few days. But if you get a chance to change your underwear and a pair of socks, it could make all the difference in your disposition. Uh, and make sure you have things to eat uh, and eat off of. Plates, uh, plasticware. If you can't get back into your house, you're going to need to be able to utilize this. Otherwise, you're going to be using a lot of fingers. So how do you evacuate your house? Again, how do you evacuate your neighborhood? How many of you guys know how to get out of here? Where would you go? Do you have a place to go? Because that's the other thing. So all right, let's evacuate the neighborhood. So where are you going? And do they know you're coming? Yeah. Right? What are you going to do once you get out of your house and start driving? Where do you go next? What kind of hazards do you have in your home? You know, you get slip, trip, and fall issues. Uh, throw ropes become a hazard, right? Different things for balance and mobility, steps. What other hazards are in your house? What other things do you need to keep out of your pathway out the door? Uh, how many guys have a bed under a window? Do you know, uh, as if that building shakes and that window breaks, you're going to be under glass. And, and hopefully they're newer windows so that they don't break into uh, little guillotine uh, shaped pieces. Or a picture over your bed that can land on your head and also keep you from going somewhere. Although it looks nice for aesthetics. It may look beautiful. It may be the hazard to your health. Uh, is your water heater secured? We said 25, 50 gallons. Is it strapped to the wall? Is your foundation strapped? You know, your house strapped to the foundation. Because guess what? Remember that table that moves when you're trying to hide under it? The house also shakes off a foundation. Uh, closed toed shoes under the bed. Something to put on your feet to get you walking through the house. Glow sticks and again, extra clothing. I don't know what you're sleeping. I don't need to know what you're sleeping. <laughs> but if, uh, depending on what that is, make sure you have something to slip into before you slip out of the house. All right? Remember something. There's only, uh, there are some things we can never unsee. So, just for the record, make sure you have some stuff. So, if you think you're evacuating, again, as I was telling you about the freeway systems, this is not a fluke. What you saw here in Northridge, we saw the same thing happen right before this up in, in San Francisco. Silmar had issues, right? Uh, look, folks, we're dealing with earthquakes all around us. And I'm not telling you that the big one's coming. Although, you know, you know, they're now developing early warning systems for earthquakes. You know how much of a warning you're going to get? 12 seconds. Maybe. Maybe two or three, depending on how far away the earthquake is. I'm going to give you a better warning system. And I hear people tell me that, oh, we don't get one. I'm giving you a warning right here, right now. 
we're gonna have an earthquake. <laughs> Prepare, okay? Just put stuff in place. It'll save you from power failures, it'll save you. Now you've been warned, okay? There's your early warning system. Chris, Chris, question here. Oh, sorry. We both have a question about oxygen. Yes, yes. ma'am. Those of us that are on oxygen, what do you suggest? Um, yes. I've been told to, to contact my uh, Department of Water and Power, you know, let them know that I have this issue, put me on the top of your list, go to your fire department, say, hey, I'm in your, I'm in your neighborhood, just in case. Now, I keep extra oxygen in my car mm -hmm. because I go here, there, and yon. Mm -hmm. And like you say, I might be by myself for a while. Is there a recommendation, like, how much you should keep with you or not keep with you or... Well, I don't know what you consume, okay? Right. So I can't really give you a good figure on that. But my thought is that there's a few extra tanks left in your house. How many tanks you go through a day? Well, it depends on what I'm doing. By, by, I, that's, again, yeah. and I, I, I throw that question out not to make fun, right. but uh, just to, to give you an idea as to how random that, you know, the difference right. that could make. So depending on what your need is, Fire departments, look, I'm going to tell you, even though they know you're in the neighborhood, don't take it personally. No. But they may not be able to get to you. Right. Um, I just want to make sure. Right, right, right. The um, uh, same thing with the Department of Water and Power. I'm going to tell you a little story about what happened to me down in San Pedro. I had the San Pedro Hospital under my uh, jurisdiction, so to speak, and we had a power failure down there. Uh, we, one of the issues we had down there is our emergency generator runs on three hamsters and a, and a uh, gerbil. And the gerbil was pretty sick as they were running around in this wheel to keep our emergency generator running. Well, this is through Edison, and Edison power went down, knocked out. So we have multi-phase motors down there, so we needed the different phases to come in and keep stuff working. And I won't get into the technicality of that. but. When we called them in and said, look, our power's out, we need, uh, you know, you need to help us. They were like, well, you know, sorry. Like, what do you mean sorry? Apparently our address showed up different th than the hospital address on their end. So we were basically told, deal with it. Uh, because, you know, the, the hospital address is 1300 West 7th Street. It came up on, from our PBX as 1304. West 7th Street, so they didn't have that listed as an issue, yes. so they told us, deal. <laughs> nice. Wow. Hey, thanks, guys. Really appreciate the support. I have a couple of hundred patients in here, and I'm sure are going to be thrilled to hear that, uh, you know, I'm sorry. So, again, oxygen, you're going to need to figure that out. I, I, I can't tell you that. Maybe you have some type of battery backup. Maybe you have some type of generator, which may be the best thing you can do. Uh, because then you can charge anything you need, right? Uh, there was another question. Yes, sorry, you hide behind a tree. Yes, I do like to hide behind the tree. <laughs> you know, if there's a gas leak or there's going to be a fire, and you're on oxygen that's plugged into the wall, uh, isn't that dangerous? I mean, absolutely. Uh, Repeat the question. The question was, if you're on oxygen and there is a fire, uh, is it, and it's plugged into the wall, isn't that dangerous? Now, is your oxygen, do you actually have a, a machine that comes from your wall, or is it plugged, or you're talking about your concentrator. oxygen concentrator is plugged into the wall, right? Right. What it is? Yes, that's yes. what it is. And I asked that question, you know, you got to remember I come from a hospital where we actually plug the oxygen into the wall. So, yeah, I got it. Uh, it's part of my naivety. So it was, you know, yes, it is going to be dangerous. The oxygen is. But perhaps the concentrator can be moved with you. I saw a gentleman in the back that had a pretty portable looking one. You know, not necessarily a, uh, a big one that's just going to be staying in the house and you're just tethered to it. What I have just stays in the house. Okay. Plugs into the wall. Yes. Right. So yes. that would have to go with you out of the house, depending on where you go, because that's going to be your lifeline. Or you need to have extra uh, tanks, maybe portable tanks that you can. But it's plugged house. in. Right. No, the it's concentrator portable. is it's not. plugged in. I get that, but maybe you have spare right. tanks, just separate uh, east yeah, tanks or east. Yeah. Yes. I think this is a good time to.
contact your oxygen company and ask them what their emergency plan is for you having oxygen. Excellent idea. They have to have some sort of a uh, plan to bring you oxygen or to be whether it's, you know, even if it's not liquid doctor, you can use it in a tank or something. Call them and ask them what their plan is. Because they're certainly going to know that it's going on. And yes. Mike, if you want to plug it, that you can say. What? Yeah, I'm I'm it. Oh, if you unplug it, it'll be fine. I never need my one in anyway. When I grab it up, I pull the plug. I didn't. Huh? I oh, really? Uh, always. And that's oh, that's a good that. point too. Is that you can unplug it and it doesn't generate oxygen. Wait, wait, wait. Why would I need to I don't want to make my phone. I need. I just pull out my TV. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Chris, you know, you know, yes, ma'am. Why is it good to unplug it and talk to the Yeah, I don't know. 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 Yeah, Oh, some left in right. the machine. But oh. again, if you're going to oh, evacuate, yeah. evacuate with your equipment. Mm -hmm. If you can get out of the house with this stuff, that's what your plan should be. That is your lifeline. Make sure you have a plan. So, bottle of water. This is for your car. You guys all drive. Everybody has a... Uh, you keep a kit in your car. You have a kit pretty close to you. So, five first aid kit. Basically, all of the above that we discussed earlier. Jumper cables. Blanket, flashlight, batteries, uh, flares, fire extinguishers, spare clothes. Oh, okay. Okay? What's Just, the back of the... Uh, what's that? Uh, how to get yourself a little bit more information. How many of you folks have been through a CERT training? Your community emergency response team. This means you guys know how to do light search and rescue. You can dig through rubble if you had to, shore up stuff to get to folks in need. You know how to signal to one another to let you know if you're safe. Know how to do, have you, any of you ever taken a uh, Map Your Neighborhood program? Map Your Neighborhood lets you, instead of having a Tupperware party, okay, you have this little party in your living room, on your patio, with your neighbors. And with that, you start to identify the different resources you have available to you on your own block, or in your apartment building, or whatever that may be. You may have a plumber living right across the street from you. You know, one of the anomalies that I, that I found when I moved to California was how many people didn't know their neighbors. Couldn't believe it. You may wave, you may do this, but you have no idea what they do. You know, you may have a resource right across the street from you that you wouldn't know until you have this discussion. Maybe a nice time to introduce yourself to the neighbors, let them know this, you know, different things. But when you're able to collectively prepare a neighborhood to deal with a disaster, you'll be that much stronger in numbers and be able to take care of those that are a little bit more in need than others. You identify the folks that may have an issue and may need to get their oxygen hooked up to another power source or something. There may be a generator on your block that may be able to help you. Or there may be a surgical center that has a generator in it right around the block from you. Identify what you have in your neighborhoods, okay? Uh, I'm not going to necessarily make you go through an EMT class, but these are pretty helpful. Map your neighborhood and any type of earthquake and disaster preparedness program, although you've got a pretty good one right today. So a bit of homework, a couple of things you need to do. Count how many things you drive over and under on a daily basis. Even if you're just going up the hill or you're going anywhere. You'd be surprised that there's little overpasses that we drive over that would not be accessible, or underpasses. Just driving down Torrance Boulevard to Weston, what do you have over the top? Yeah. Little train trestle, right? Yeah. So you get the you get the point. So if you imagine being stuck, so I want you guys to that's one. Two is to do a little fire walk, drill walkthrough, make a plan. Now imagine you're primary source of uh, your primary exit point is blocked with fire. How would you get out the second one? Or if you live upstairs, how many of you guys live uh, in a house that has two stories? Are the bedrooms on the second floor? Okay, your stairs are on fire. How are you getting out of your house? Rope ladder. 
If there's a fire at the bottom of your stairs, how are you getting out? Now, you, you can tell I'm a lot of fun at parties because I'm making you think about this. You need to think about this now, not after there's a fire. Okay, because that could be the last thing you ever think about. And I can I'll pretty much guarantee you, if there's a fire and you can't get down your steps, you're going to be like, you know, <laughs> I should have had a plan. So, do a little fire drill. And any of your family members that come over, if you, and you have friends that come over, stay over. Visit from out of state, out of the city. Teach them how to get out of your house, too. And we won't get into caring for your kids, but make sure that you have a means of being able to take care of those around you. Or yourself, yes ma'am. Um, a source of power that you can use to charge your cell phones and your laptop or your tablet or whatever is your car. Correct. We all pretty much usually have our car very full on. So in my car, I have the adapter and the charger for my cell phone and for my iPad. So I don't have to worry. I do also have the solar charger. But if my cell phone were low on energy, I just start the car and plug in the cell phone, plug in the tablet. And even if I have no electricity in the house, I can charge my cell phone. And that's going to be your lifeline to what's going on outside of the world. And, and that's a great point. And understand that there are even converters for your car to switch it to a 110 power type outlet. My wife's car had the outlet with the converter in the car itself. And a couple of Christmases ago, we had lost power as well. And I was able to make coffee the next morning out in the garage, plugged into the car, which made me very happy. I did. <laughs> You know, I, I don't ask for much, but a cup of coffee was, it was worth its weight in gold, I assure you. But again, knowing how to tap into that resource, knowing how to utilize the uh, power. The other thing about the car is if you have a trunk, I have a small uh, survival kit in there. I have really comfortable walking shoes. I have a blanket that folds easily. I have a, a sweatshirt in case it's cold. I have a t-shirt. You know, just gotta have water in there and some food, of course. Just if I'm away from home, if I'm on the road and the bridge has gone down. Or but if your car is part of your plan, what else do you need to have in your car to keep it to yeah. turn it on? You need gasoline. Yeah. So make sure that you don't let your car go down beyond a half a tank. Okay? It'll keep you in a good place. You'll always be able to get a pretty good distance if you had to, or be able to run your car for some time. Yes, sir. There are a number of solar LED lines in right. the marketplace, and many of them have a plug-in converter that you can basically charge cell phones or small lights or small lights. And, and that's a good point. And some of them actually have cranks that you can crank up as well. Now, there's stuff out there, folks. Look, there's places to get a whole lot of stuff. They, you know, there's a place called Major Surplus over in Gardena. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I'm not here to endorse any one place over another. But I got to tell you, every time I go into that place, I need to stop and get extra cash. Because every time I walk in there, there's always something like, oh, now I really want one of those. Tell us again what it was. Uh, it's Major Surplus over on, uh, on Alondra and... Uh, Broadway or right? Uh, it, it's right just south of Redondo Beach Boulevard uh, in Gardena. Uh, there was a question? Yes, sir. I understand that you have a solar system. Once the electric goes out, you can't tap in. Is there any way you can? Uh, I'm not familiar with bypassing and going through that solar process, but maybe you can give the folks a call that hooked up that solar uh, stuff. I, I, I don't have the expertise to tell you one way or another, and I don't want to put your life at risk trying to tap into your electrical supply system. Yes, ma'am. Uh, most of all this applies, but what about if you have a mobile home versus a house? Any different tips? The, quite honestly, it's pretty much a uh, standard process. Uh, the only difference you have is in wind events, that being elevated, you have a, the issue of lift. Uh, and we haven't really had a hurricane here, although we've had the effects of one that have been coming up the coast. Uh, we've had four tornadoes here locally, Long Beach, up to, all the way up to Pasadena in the last five years. So that could put you at risk as well. Just, but there's really no way to, because your house is elevated, there's really no way to truly mitigate that fact without it being bolted down. Is it still true, though, that 
most, okay, stay here in bed. We have the earth Right. I was always told from the get-go, stay in bed, because if you get up, the piles will come up. Is that and, still true? Well, as long as you're able to cover your head, because the biggest thing you have at risk besides cuts during an earthquake is things falling on you. Remember, Dr. Lucy Jones also says, there's a couple of things. One, earthquakes don't kill people. It's what we build where there's earthquakes that kill people. Okay? And, again, depending on the, the structure, cover your head. Get yourself into a position. Do you know where the struts are under your house? Yeah, they're down the middle, I think. Well, then know where those are too, because that you can avoid those spots if you need to get underneath something. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that any reinforced concrete building, again, I'm quoting Dr. Lucy Jones, that she had a term that she used to use for uh, concrete buildings that were not reinforced for earthquake, and she used to call them FPRs. You know what an FPR is? It's a future pile of rubble. <laughs> so make sure you set yourself up and know your risk. Set yourself up to protect yourself. Yes, sir. You mentioned a store uh, that I, I I have never heard of before. What did you say they carry? Uh, major surplus is a major surplus. surplus? Major. Uh, they have. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here trying not to endorse any one place, and I think I'm, I'm doing a great job of selling. But they have a uh, all kinds of survival equipment. They have uh, meals ready to eat. They have uh, uh, sleeping bags, camping equipment, um, various old batteries, survival okay. stuff. It's a it's an incredible place. In Gardena. It is in Gardena. Thank you. It's basically an REI except it's surplus. Yeah. Gotcha. But bring extra cash. Yeah. yeah. That's all I'm going to tell you. Just bring it, and not that they're expensive, but you're going to want more of other stuff. Right. Guaranteed. Uh, that said, this is a uh, list of resources. If you go on to ready.gov, this is the FEMA or the uh, the, the National uh, Preparedness site. You have the uh, Governor's Office of Emergency Services. You have FEMA. You have Be Prepared California, which again is another site. And the uh, uh, National Weather Service and uh, the Oce Oceanic... Uh, group at .gov, at NOAA.gov, but they'll give you guys information. Are all of you guys on the Torrance Alert system? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You can still get the Torrance information. It'll be close enough to you to keep you protected. But the Torrance Alerts, albeit that, um, you know, it's great getting information, you're going to get more information. If you don't move quick enough, you're going to get it on 14 different devices. But at least you get the information. And I'd rather have the information and not need it than to need it and not get it. Okay? That's you? Sorry. I'll, I'll give you a second. I'll stall. So, yes, sir. One of the things that we have created in our neighborhood is an emergency call list. And the reason for that is, like, if you have pets and they're hit by a car or something, we can call somewhat. Mm -hmm. You can call their parents or call their grandparents if there's a disaster. If nothing else, you let them know that everything's okay. That's, I, I think that's a great uh, great plan. And But again, that takes contacting your neighbors and interacting with them. I think that's great, and I highly encourage that. My neighbors, I have, there's got to be a good 10 days, 10 to 14 days worth of goods for myself, my wife, and three cats. Except my wife's a nurse, I'll be at the hospital, so chances are both of us will be. So now I have 14 days worth of stuff that's sitting in the back room. What's your address? <laughs> well, here is, uh, here is the other thing. Uh, that my next door neighbors, I have three generations of women living next door. So I told them, look, if something happens, Cheryl and I go to work in here. Here's my supplies. All I ask, you have, you can have at what you need. All I ask is that you take care of our cats while we're at work. <laughs> Sounds like a nice fair trade, right? I'm good. I got the supplies. We're cool. Yes, ma'am. Uh, not, I'm not sure, but George Butts runs your CERT program there, and uh, knowing George, there's got to be something there, all right? Uh, I would communicate with your CERT folks in Manhattan Beach, and you'd probably be able to get down that path, okay? 
Guys, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah. Betsy, did you want to share something before? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Well, that holds true with anything. So if you can divvy up your goods and not keep all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. But if you have a secure garage, you have a secure back room, uh, even if you have a bunch of days worth of food in your house, then you keep it just a backup supply somewhere else. So there's a couple of different locations. Because one, you may not be able to get back in your house, or two, you may not be able to get in your garage. But the odds that both of them would be in that predicament would be uh, slim. My daughter-in-law the what was her question? Oh, we didn't hear her question. Ladies and gentlemen, please. It was uh, just a matter of where we keep disaster supplies, and uh, this young lady here was explaining to me about her daughter kept all of her eggs in one basket in the kitchen uh, during the Northridge earthquake, except for the fact that she lived in Northridge and the house didn't hold up so well. So there went your disaster supply. But everything else fell out. Folks, there are different tools you can use, and I, you know, I just saw in the news that another kid died because of a, a dresser not being strapped to the wall, and the dresser falls down. And now this is just during normal business. So imagine uh, something shaking, TVs falling off a wall. The Napa earthquake that took place a couple of Easter's ago, there was one death, and you know what that was from? The TV fell off the shelf and hit the woman in the head. <laughs> Put yourself, protect yourself, folks. We know you live in a place that there's earthquakes. All right? Just put these tools in place and it'll increase your chances of thriving during an event. Okay? Guys, thank you very much. Thank you for letting me share this.